Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the webinar. Uh, yes, Eric, I got your email. I'll send you a response probably right after class here. I had not got a chance to respond to it this morning yet. Morning, everybody. How's it going or afternoon, depending on where you're at? And welcome back to our webinar. Um, first note is please make sure you are following the Google Meet rules of conduct. They're still posted on the Moodle page. Um, I will be going over quizzes at the beginning of the class, but not every student has taken last week's quiz, so I can't go over it. So we will go over it next week. Um, yeah, I think that's about all the housekeeping stuff I have. Uh, most people did great on the quiz, lots of great scores on the quiz. Um, one thing, make sure that you are checking Judgy for your scores in this class. Um, there was one of the questions I talked with one student. They brought up that one question where the language was kind of wishy-washy, and we'll talk about it next week when everybody's taking it. So I give everybody credit for that question. So if you want to know what your current quiz score is, look on Judgy, not Moodle, because it's very hard to update anything on Moodle. On top of that, Moodle also incorporates your webinar grade, participation grade, and your discussion grades. And it also has the appropriate weighting for all of those grades. So if you just look at your Moodle score and you got a, did great on the quiz, but you didn't do the discussion forums, then your class score is actually pretty low because you didn't do that stuff. You did horrible on the quiz and you're worried about the class, but you did the discussions and came to the webinar, then your, your total grade is actually probably pretty good. So make sure you look on Judgy. Those are the scores that count. Those are the ones that matter. Uh, the Moodle grade book I leave up just so you can immediately see what your score is after a quiz. Because uh, if I took, if I made it so you couldn't see Moodle grade book at all, then you couldn't actually see immediately. And, and I like for you to have that feedback, even if you can't review your quiz. I know. All right, so make sure to look at Judgy. If you're trying to look at your grades, trying to see what you currently have in the class. Um, if you have missed any discussion forums or quizzes, it's not too late to make them up, but if it goes past a week past the due date, it will be too late. Um, I don't really like to hound students for stuff they miss. It's your job to know when you miss something and just shoot me an email. It's not a big deal. Do not mind opening up quizzes. I do not mind going back and putting grades for discussion forums, right? I'm fine. Um, but... Like I said, I don't like to chase down students for things that they didn't get to do. And you should, if you missed it, it's not a problem. But sometimes I'll send you an email and sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll be like, all right, all right, you got a zero. All right. Yeah, that's all the housekeeping stuff I got. Um, so let's talk this week about encoding. So encoding is probably the hardest concept in MRI physics. Whether we're talking about in the Physics 1 class or here in this class, this week tends to be the one that is the most difficult to get. Um, but this week is a very essential part of MRI. So I'd like to do a little overview of where we're at in the class every single week. Let's take a look really quick at the course page. So these first three weeks of contrast review, encoding, and case space, these are the core of how we scan an MRI. These three, three, three things together determine what our pole sequences are going to look like. All right. Contrast is what is bright and what is not doing RF pulses. This week, we're going to talk about gradients or second magnetic forces that create the resolution. And then case space is how we organize the data. So if you think about it, every time we set up a different pole sequence, which is the set of images, we're using these three things together, RF, gradients, and case space. After these first, after weeks two, three, and four, the rest of this class is simply different types of pole sequences. And this one says flow phenomena, but it's really another week of pole sequences. So you can think of weeks two, three, and four as the basis of MRI, and then this, these are all of the other different things that we can do, right? So weeks five, seven, eight, and nine are all different pole sequences. So let's see. All right. So these three weeks are all different types of, or these four weeks are different types of pole sequences. Then we review parameters, which we'll keep introducing new parameters as we go. And then we just talk about what happens when things go wrong in your scan. So not understanding weeks two, three, and four means that week five is going to be pretty hard to understand because this is just talking about variations in contrast encoding and case space. 
In pull sequences two, we'll talk about different variations of contrast encoding in K-space. So if you don't understand contrast encoding in K-space, none of the rest of the class will make any sense, right? We're learning the basics, and then we're learning all the variations of those basics. So this is week two. This is our, our second lesson in these three fundamental steps in how we scan MRI, all right? So this week, we are going to learn about something called encoding. All right. That is what we will be talking about today. All right. At this point, we are 10 minutes into the lecture, so most people should be sharing your video by now. All right. Let's go into the PowerPoints. Okay, encoding, encoding. What does encoding mean? It means we are putting a code into the echo. All right, so it's right there in the name. So one of the problems we have with MRI is that we are, one of the essential problems we have with all medical imaging is we are trying to make a two-dimensional picture from a three-dimensional object. This is always imperfect, right? This is always imperfect. You can't perfectly create a 2D representation of a three-dimensional object. This is a problem with photography and videos, right? And uh, hopefully everybody here has seen a case of this where there's a photo where it looks like somebody's doing something bad, but really it's just a weird angle or caught at an extremely weird point in time. Sure, everybody's seen the videos on or like the pictures that people put on Instagram where they reach up and they're like holding the sun or they're holding the moon, right? Are they really holding the sun and moon? No, they just had a correct perspective to take a photograph to make it look like they are holding the sun or the moon. MRI is the same way, except now what we have to worry about is that if we are not properly representing the anatomy or pathology of the patient, the patient cannot get a correct diagnosis. Right. And if you miss cancer and six months go by and that cancer grows and then the patients, they find the cancer. Well, if you would have had a proper picture, that six months, the patient could have received treatment that can massively change the outcome of disease processes. Right. So understanding that idea that we are trying to do this, that there's this flaw between turning two dimensional pictures into our three dimensional objects into two dimensional pictures helps us understand why encoding is so important. Because this is what is going to help us um, create these accurate pictures. We have to understand the encoding to understand how the pictures are made. All right. So I want to start with kind of looking at our end goal of understanding today, and then we'll work backwards from there. I have a great animation for this one. So I live and die by the animation. So when we think about making an MRI image, we have two different things that kind of constitute what we consider in the image. First and foremost is the contrast, which is what we talk about, which is what we talked about last week. All right. Last week we talked about contrast. No, it doesn't want to share. Give me just a second. Can you all see my screen? I'm not showing anything. No? Yeah. All right. I have to figure out some solution because Google Meet does not like this many people being on it for some reason.
All right, everybody, I'm going to try to exit the webinar and come right back. Give me just a second, see if that lets me share my screen. I'm still here as well, everyone. So if you have any questions while Kevin's trying to load that up, just let me know. Uh, no, usually I work uh, I work kind of a day p.m. shift. Usually my shift is like 2 to 10 at night. But then on Saturdays and Sunday, I work the morning shifts. So Saturday and Sundays, I'm working from like 7 a.m. to usually 7 p.m. So I do 12 hours on the weekends. move to California. I don't know if I could pay my wife enough to move to California. <laughs> Unfortunately. Uh, I like to visit California and play in California. I don't know if I would, I would live in California, though. You guys can come to me. That's just fine. I, I do like Utah. However, I'm I'm thinking about moving myself. So I don't know. All right, can you see my screen now? Yeah, Kevin, that looks a lot better. All right, awesome, thank you. Okay, thanks for taking over, Mike, I appreciate that. Okay, so when we think about making an MRI image, we have two things that we are going to consider. We're going to consider the contrast and then what we call the resolution or the ability to see sharp lines. All right, sharp lines in the image. So this animation is gonna show you the difference between the two. So first off, here's an image. You can ignore this, this is case space, and we're gonna talk about that next week. But if we take away the resolution of the image, then we are left with what we talked about last week, which is contrast. This is an image that has contrast, but no resolution. Remember, contrast we're defining as areas that are dark and bright. When we talk about contrast, we're talking about certain tissues are bright and certain tissues are dark. Is it T1 weighted, where we have bright fat, dark fluid? Or is it T2 weighted, where we have dark fat, bright fluid? So that's what the contrast of the image is. It's the colors that we're painting here, all in the shade of gray, but that's what we're really shading doing. Resolution then is the sharp lines in the image. So if we look at an image with just the resolution, all we can see is the outline of all the structures. Encoding is what gives us these sharp lines. You can almost think about it as a paint by numbers. Encoding is making the outline, and then the RF energy is determining what color you're painting all the different structures inside of it. All right. So that's our goal this week. We want to understand how these sharp lines get made. Because if we don't have good sharp lines of anatomy, then the radiologist can't tell healthy tissue from damaged tissue. Right. And then they can't make a diagnosis. Okay, gradients are, uh, are what control resolution. RF energy controls contrast. Resolution is controlled by gradients. And gradients are magnetic forces that we turn on and turn off. The main magnetic field is always on. Gradients turn on and turn off. And you've seen this if you've gone into clinicals, there's a sign somewhere where it says the magnet is always on. Well, that's referring to the main magnetic field, the really, really strong magnetic field of the MRI machine. The gradients are much, much weaker magnetic forces that turn on and off. Gradients are what you hear when the MRI machine is scanning. 
you're hearing the gradients turning on and then turning off. You're hearing them go dun, 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 dun. That sound you're hearing is metal expanding and contracting as we push electricity through the MRI scanner, altering the magnetic field within the patient. All right. So RF energy gives us contrast. Gradients give us resolution. Resolution is how sharp or blurry an image looks. This image has very low resolution. You can see how blurry the image looks. These images, on the other hand, have more resolution. See how much sharper the lines are of the image. And then here we have even sharper and sharper resolution. So I like looking at these two next to each other, <clears throat> excuse me, because you can see this blurriness that's kind of gone here. This is higher resolution image. This is a lower resolution image. Now you can think of this pretty much like you think of televisions and computer monitors, right? We have a high resolution picture, right? High def, right? High definition is what you usually call it TV, right? So we have like a 1080p television where you have like a 4K. Well, the 4K has a much sharper image because it has better resolution. Same thing with your MRI images. Based on certain parameters we're gonna talk about this week, we can make the images look sharper or we can make them look more blurry. All right, so that's what we mean by resolution, is how sharp or blurry the image looks. All right. And we make this resolution through gradients, which are a seg second magnetic force that alter the strength of the main magnetic field. So we have the main magnet, then we turn on a gradient that alters that magnetic force. What gradients are, are coils of wire that when a current is passed through them, alter the main magnetic field. So here is B sub zero. Remember B sub zero is the main magnetic field, 1.5 Tesla, three Tesla, 0 0.3, whatever it is, right? That is, the, that is the main magnetic field. When we put electricity through these wires in the gradients, if this is the middle of our magnetic field, on this side of the magnet, the magnetic force gets lesser, and on this side of the magnet, the magnetic force gets greater. Right. So when we turn on, go ahead. Amy. So if it's a three T magnet, then it's less. The further away, like the Tesla would be weaker. Yes, it would get stronger on one side of the magnet and weaker on the other when we turned on the gradient. Yes. So it's going to make the gradient, that it's going to make the magnetic field stronger on one end or lower on another because it's a new magnetic force we're adding, right? So as we add more force, the magnetism, it's gonna get stronger and weaker. So these wires are inside of the MRI bore where the patient is laying down. And the gradients are what you hear because when we put a lot of electricity very quickly through these wires and then turn it off, the metal inside those wires expands and then contracts. And that's the sound of MRI. The dun, 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 dun. Those sounds, that's the sound of electricity passing through the gradient, turning the gradient on, and then turning the gradient off. So we call it a gradient because it changes the magnetic field linearly. What I mean by that is that when a gradient is turned on, right? I like to think about it like it's a seesaw. Right? The middle, the magnetic force in the middle of the magnet never changes. 
When I turn on a gradient, it's going to make one side of the magnet stronger and one side of the magnet weaker. I can use different strengths of the magnet, right? That's a, I can make it stronger and stronger, or I can make it weaker and weaker. So gradients don't turn on to the same strength every time. They have different amounts of strength simply based on how much electricity we put through the coils of wire. The middle of the magnet, the middle of the um, magnet, never has its magnetic force changed. So here is a gradient turning on, very strongly increasing magnetic force on this side of the magnet, and just as strong on this side, making it weaker. So this is the middle of the magnet. We're making, if we were to measure in distance, let's say we were two feet in both ways, we were to measure the magnetic force, this side would have gotten just as strong as this one got weak. But the middle would stay the same. It's once again like a seesaw, where the middle of the seesaw never really changes in elevation. This side can get higher or it can get lower. This side can get higher and lower. I can have it go this way or this way, but the middle never changes at all. Yes, that's, got, that's the isocenter. That's also the best place to scan the patient. Oh, go ahead, Kathleen. Try to answer. So the gradients never change or alter the strength of isocenter. It just shifts it on the ends of the B0 field. Correct. Correct. Now, when I say isocenter never changes, isocenter is like a very tiny little microscopic area. It's like the dead, dead center of this gradient force. It's not like the isocenter is like a foot long. It's a very, very tiny little area, right? But the very center of the mag magnet never has its force change. Not the fringe field, because the fringe field is talking about the main magnetic field. We're not talking about the fringe field, because that would only come from the main magnetic field. And we consider that in safety options, which we usually talk about when the gradients are turned off. Isocenter is the best place to scan. Isocenter is the best place to scan, the middle of the gradient. And when you go and you lay a patient down and you put these little laser lights on the patient, you're marking the patient so they move to isocenter. Because ideally, that's where you want to scan the patient. All right. Yeah, go ahead, Emma. It's so like um, if the patient has like a pacemaker that's MRI conditional, would the gradients affect like the that stuff? If it's yeah, like absolutely. Okay. Yeah, and that's why if you have a conditional pacemaker that you're doing, the patient has to be hooked up to um, a machine that will monitor the patient's heart while you're doing it. Because what happens is you turn the pacemaker off, right? So what is a pacemaker? Pacemaker is there. So if a patient starts having some kind of abnormality in their heart, the pacemaker can send a shock to the heart to make sure the patient doesn't have like cardiac arrest or something else happens. So a pacemaker is not always in use. It's always monitoring the patient, but it's not constantly doing something with the patient. So when we want to scan a patient in MRI with a pacemaker, the manufacturer comes in, turns the pacemaker off, and they have, you have to have the manufacturer there. Not a, you don't have to have a cardiologist, but you have to have a nurse present who is now tracking the patient's cardiac. So they will have the ECG on the patient and they'll be, they'll be checking their heart. So in case there is some kind of cardiac event while they're in the MRI, you know immediately and you can go in and help the patient. Because if you left the, the pacemaker on, the gradient would fry it. The gradient would destroy it. Yeah. So that's how we do pacemakers. It's like a big to-do when you do a pacemaker in MRI. You have to have a representative from the pacemaker company there to turn it on and off. You have to have a nurse monitoring it. You have to have a cardiologist usually sign off on it. Whether they have to be present or not, once again, I think there's people from lots of different states here, and that becomes a state-by-state -state thing. Um, I know that's not a requirement. Everywhere I know, though, is like you've got to have a nurse monitoring vitals, and you have to have somebody there who can turn off 
the pacemaker itself and then turn it back on and also test to make sure it's still working once it's turned back on, right? So you got to turn it off, make sure it's still working, do the scan or turn it off, do all that fun stuff. Yeah. So it takes a lot. It takes a lot. Yeah, every place. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, there's different rules. Different states have different regulations, um, although there's not too many regulations with MRI in a lot of places. Okay, when we talk about the strength of the gradient, we talk about it as the slope of the gradient. So we talk about slope. We're talking about how strong the gradient is turned on. If a gradient has what we call a shallow slope, then we're not using very much energy in the gradient. If the gradient has a really strong magnetic force, then we say it is a steep slope. And that's how we'll talk about gradients throughout the rest of this class. Shallow slopes and steep slopes, right? So here is a shallow gradient. So this line is showing that we're not changing the magnetic force very much. And then here is a steep gradient showing that we're doing a lot of change to the magnetic force. So why do we change magnetic force, right? Why do we care? We care because last week we talked about how we have this thing called the Larmor equation where we can determine the, the processional frequency of protons based on the strength of the magnet. The stronger the magnetic force, the faster the protons move, the higher the processional frequency. When we first put a patient into an MRI machine and there are no gradients turned on, you know this because when you go into the room, there's no sounds, right? You don't hear any dun, 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 dun. I hope you're not going into the room when the gradients are on. It's not usually a good thing. Um, it's fine. Um, all of the protons are now being affected by the same magnetic force. So all of the protons have the exact same processional frequency. But when we turn on a gradient, we are now making one part of the gradient stronger and one part of it weaker. So the magnetic force of the, inside the patient is now different across the gradient. So when we turn on a gradient, here's our machine that's a one Tesla magnet. But here we made the magnetic force 0 0.005 stronger, which means equal distance over here from the isocenter we will make it 0 0.9995. So we made it that much weaker of a magnetic force on that side of the magnet, and we made it that much stronger of a magnetic force on this side of the magnet. So when the patient first went in, before, before um, we started scanning the patient and turning on gradients, Right? All the protons had the same magnetic force, so they all had the processional frequency. Once we turn on the gradient, now different protons have different processional frequencies based on where they are along the gradient. Uh, no, Kathleen, because the gradients wouldn't be on. I'm talking about when you walk around the magnet, when it's turned off, that's just the main magnetic field. That's just the main magnetic field, yeah. Because most of the time you're in the room, the gradients aren't on. Right, you don't usually go in the room while the machine's running. You can, can, but it can cause artifacts and cause a lot of problems. So we try not to. Okay. So magnetic isocenter is the very center of all the gradients. We're going to see here in a minute that we have three gradients. We're going to talk about there's three different gradients inside the MRI machine. Now, also note that when you turn off the gradient. All of the protons will go back to the processional frequency of the main magnetic field. So we turn on a gradient, the different amounts of strength change, we change the magnetic force across the patient, we change processional frequency across the patient, we turn the gradient off, 
and all the protons are now only affected once again by the main magnetic field, all the protons return to their original precessional frequency. So we turn on a gradient, magnetic force gets altered. Anytime we alter magnetic force, precessional gradients gets affected. We turn off the gradient, we return to the same magnetic force, whatever the test of the magnet is, right? And then precessional frequency returns back to what it was originally. Oh, yeah, they have an extra nine in there. I never noticed that. Yes, Imine, what's your question? Sorry, I have so much questions. Huh? I'm a little confused. Um, would this affect like the the RF RF pulse when it's trying to to get everything in frequency? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. That's what it, that's part of encoding. That's one of our three types of encoding, and that's what a slice is. Okay. Is yeah. Yeah, we'll get there. You're you're just a little ahead of the game. We'll get there. We'll get there. All right. So the magnet, the center of the magnetic field does not change. It always has a steady magnetic field. Okay. Okay, gradients are magnetic forces that change over time. They turn on and they turn off. This is different from the main magnetic field, which does not change over time. It's always on, doesn't change. The strength of the magnetic field of the gradient is called the amplitude. So amplitude and steepness are the same. Okay? Amplitude and steepness are the same. So when I say there's a shallow gradient, it has a low amplitude. And amplitude is a word we use in MRI that just means a certain amount of energy. Low amplitude means there's low energy. High amplitude means there's high energy. A shallow gradient is low amplitude. A steep gradient is high amplitude. I will mostly talk in terms of steep and shallow gradients. I won't use the term amplitude as much because I find it's easier to understand if, if we use that language. The maximum amplitude of the gradient determines the maximum resolution. So the sharpest your image can get is dependent on the strongest your gradient can get. And this is an upgrade option when you buy an MRI machine. You can buy what they call high performance gradients. And those are gradients that turn on stronger than the average gradient. Um, and this can sometimes really annoy people because uh, I used to work in a trailer. It was a hospital, right? And in the hospital, they had an MRI machine. Um, I haven't booted you off, Stephanie, so that may be probably with your internet connection or something. There's some other reason. Um, so, um, lost my train of thought. So, when they hired another company, they said, we have too many MRIs. We can't keep doing them inside of our, our room because we're, we've got like, you know, so many patients to schedule. So they hire another company who brings out a trailer with an MRI and they put the trailer in the parking lot of the hospital. So now they have an extra MRI. They just have the patients go out through the parking lot, go to the trailer and get scanned on the on trailer, right? Some texts like hate scanning on a tra trailer. I love it because I get left alone. Right, because I get left alone. I'm like, it's awesome to have. Uh, it's awesome to be like, people can't jump in there and be like, hey, can you come do this for me? Or you know, like, hey, did you hear about this? It's like, if you want to see me, you got to come all the way out to the trailer, or I got to pick up the phone. No, I'm not doing that. So, um, I love being in a trailer. Anyways, um, the trailers are small. Yeah, yeah, it's a totally different way of of scanning, and some people hate it. I, I personally like it. Um. um and sometimes in the place I was at, the, the exact same machine was in the trailer that was inside of the hospital, except the one inside the hospital had high performance gradients and one in the parking lot did not, which means the machine in the parking lot, although it looked exactly the same, and unless you really went and looked into the software and like went through there and really looked for it, you wouldn't see that the one in the hospital had high performance gradients because it was both GE 450s 
everything you looked at, and they looked exactly the same. But the people in the trailer could never achieve the same imaging in the same amount of time as those in the hospital. And the company in the hospital, who was Kaiser, got really angry about this. They said, well, you told us you could give us the same machine, and your images don't look as good as ours. And the techs couldn't do much about this unless they scanned with more time, simply because they didn't have the stronger gradients. Yeah. And it is good to have high quality gradients. The problem with high quality gradients is the stronger your gradient, the more devices that people can't have inside of it. So you start eliminating parts of your population. So you start having patients who can be seen at a normal uh, um, gradient quality. But if you have high performance gradients, some implanted device in them, you, they're no longer safe on that machine. So you start narrowing down your patient population. Same thing with three Tesla. Why are there not a three Tesla at every single place? Because then you start less patients can be seen on a three Tesla because there's plenty of implanted devices that are safe on a 1.5, but not a 3T. So that's that's like the, the downside of it. Plus you got to pay for it. And like hospitals don't like paying for stuff. Go figure. Yeah, it, that's exactly how I feel, Jennifer. I like being in a mobile, personally. It's like, leave me alone and let me scan. Okay. So gradients also have polarity, right? When I mean polarity, it means there's a positive side to the gradient and a negative side to the gradient. That's because this tells us the direction in which electricity is moving through the coils. That means this side of the magnet is getting stronger. And this side of the gradient is getting weaker. So the positive end of the gradient creates a stronger magnetic force. And the negative end of the gradient creates a weaker magnetic force. It's the same thing with batteries. You have a battery, it's got a minus and a plus side. Why is that? Because energy, electricity flows from the minus side to the plus side. That's the flow of electricity. You have to know that when you put it inside a device because you have to make sure that the, you can close the circuit. Gradients are the same thing. The, the direction in which you push electricity will determine the positive and negative end of the gradient. You can also switch this. You can turn it and force the electricity to go in the opposite direction making this part of the gradient strong and this part of the gradient weaker, right? It's called reversing the polarity. And this is what happens. You hear this when you're scanning. Most of the time when you're scanning an MRI, it's not one sound. It's not dun, dun, dun. It's usually dun, 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 dun. Like there's two tones if you really listen to it. Because the first tone is the, grit, is the magnetic force moving in the positive direction. And then a lot of times we turn around and then move it back in the negative, depending on what pole sequence we're running. So we can, we can do that, and that's called reversing polarity. We call it polarity because we have a north pole and a south pole, right? In the planet, we have south pole, penguins, north pole, Santa. Electricity, the magnetic force of the planet goes from the south pole to the north pole. That's why it's polarity. Same idea here. Magnetization uh, force is going in, in one certain direction, so it's just like the poles of the planet. That's why we use the term polarity. So it's just like all magnetic forces, gradients have a north pole and a south pole. In gradients, polarity, determine if the electricity is running through the gradient, is going towards the front of the magnet or the back of the magnet. Gradients affect MR scanning by changing processional frequency of hydrogen protons, right? Now, that seems like a little thing. It's like, okay, they only do one thing. They change processional frequency. But a hammer, all it really does is nail, is put nails in wood. But with that knowledge, you can make a ramp for somebody who's handicapped with a hammer and nails. You can make a doghouse, right? You can do lots of different things with a hammer and nails. Very simple idea. You take something, you bash a nail in. Very simple idea. But there's lots of different things you can do if you're building something with those very simple tools. So 
So gradients only do one thing. They only change processional frequency. The tool is the gradient. What it does is change processional frequency. But with that one tool and that one, uh, one uh, action we can take with the tool, we can do lots and lots of different things in MRI, lots of crazy things in MRI. So strong gradients make proton spins faster, increasing processional frequency. It doesn't say it in here, but weak gradients make proton spin slower, decreasing processional frequency. We are using these to locate the MR signal in the body. That's the idea of encoding. When I put a patient into a machine, how does the computer know when it makes the image where everything is supposed to go? How does it, when this camera, if we thought of the camera as the MRI machine and picture of me as, as the image, how does the computer know that my eye goes right here? How does it know my nose goes right here? How does it go, know my hand goes over here? Because we turn on a gradient, we change processional frequency, and now the computer can tell where everything is. It can say, okay, well, the patient was right here. This was at isocenter. So if I had a, a gradient turned on this way, it goes, okay, well, these protons are going really fast, so I'll put them here on the image. And the protons over in this here were going really slow, so I'll put them over here. These protons didn't have any change from the gradient, so those still go in the center of the image. So now the computer can figure out where all of the protons are supposed to go based on the differing processional frequencies from the gradient. That's how we make resolution. It draws an outline and it knows where those lines go and those lines accurately represent the patient's anatomy and pathology because when we go read the echo, there's different amounts of processional frequency inside of the echo. So, gradient is the tool. The tool, what does the tool do? It changes processional frequency. Why do we use the tool? to locate the MR signal in the body, right? This is the what, this is the how, this is the why, right? What are we talking about? Gradients. How do they alter the body? By changing processional frequency. Why? So we can locate the signal in the patient's body. So now we have to talk about these two different types of gradients. Physical gradients, logical gradients. Yes, that's exactly right, Kathleen. Physical gradients. These are the actual wires located inside of the machine. Right? Logical gradients are the jobs that the physical gradients are going to do, All right? So a logical gradient is a job, right? The physical gradient are the actual wire, wires in the machine. It is the same as if you have somebody and they show up and you are in charge of a work site. It's like, okay, I've got three workers. Those are my physical gradients. Okay, you, you're going to go pick up trash. You, you're going to build a birdhouse and you, you're going to go and make sure the water is turned off. You're giving each one of these people a different job, right? So logical gradients are jobs. Physical gradients are actual wires, the actual gradients inside of the machine. After today, we will not talk much about physical gradients. We will talk about logical gradients throughout the rest of the next year. So physical gradients, we really only talk about today to understand how they work. The logical gradients, we'll be talking about those on and on and on nonstop. So the physical gradients are the wires inside the machine, and logical gradient are the jobs that these gradients do. The physical gradients are always the same, and you cannot change the wiring of the machine, short of actually opening the machine up and pulling wires out. The logical gradients change based on the orientation of your slices and some other stuff we're going to talk about, what type of pulse sequence you're running.
going to push this slide back a couple slides. This I think it'd be easier to explain that here. So the word encoded, or almost there. Sorry. The physical gradients are called X, Y, and Z. The X, the Y, and the Z. If you've done a lot of math before, it's just like when we're charting something. There's an X, there's a Y, and there's a Z plane. Right. And there are three logical gradients. Slice select, phase encoding, and frequency encoding. Right. Why are there three physical and three logical gradients? Because we're making pictures of three-dimensional objects. Each one of these different gradients will go in a different direction. X gradient will go one way, Y gradient goes another way, the Z gradient goes a different way. All right. So three gradients, three physical, three logical, because it's a three-dimensional object you're taking a picture of. So every time we do a scan, we take these three physical gradients and we give them one of the jobs. So when I run this scan, maybe the X gradient does the job of slice select. And maybe the Y gradient does the job of phase encoding. And maybe the Z gradient does the job of frequency encoding. But then when I go run my next pulse sequence, these may change. Now on this pulse sequence, maybe my Z is now my slice select gradient. And maybe my Y is now my frequency encoding gradient. And maybe the X is my phase encoding gradient. Yes, Kathleen, what's your question? Is this what gives us sagittal, coronal, and axial? Yes. Which one of the physical which gradients we is assign the to? Yes. Okay. Is exactly that. Yeah. Which is like the next, in like two slides. Because <laughs> that's what we're going to do. The rest of this lecture, we're going to be talking about slice select, phase encoding, frequency encoding. All right. We're going to be talking about that for the rest of this lecture. That's pretty much the rest of this lecture. That and talking about how that creates resolution. So this is the idea here. These are the physical gradients. Those are the actual gradients that are doing the job. That's what you hear in the machine. And these are jobs that we assign to the physical gradient. So then there are three ways to encode the echo. And when, once again, when we're talking about encode, think about it as we are putting a code in the echo. So when we create the echo in the patient, the gradients will change information inside of that echo, which will put a code in it. When the computer reads the code out of the echo, it can then create an image and put everything where it's supposed to go in the image. So encode means we are putting a code inside of the echo. The computer will then decode that information and then it'll know, okay, cool. I read the echo, this is the code inside of it, that means the eye goes here, and the mouth goes here, and the hair goes there, right? The pin's over here, so on and so forth, right? So that's what we mean by encoding. We are going to use three things. Why do we need three? Because the patients exist in three dimensions. So we've got to locate where this is coming out of the patient in all three dimensions, right? And each one of these will always be done in a different dimension. Your image will have phase encoding in one direction, frequency encoding the other, and then slice select in the other. All right? Every single image we do. So gradients are used to spatially encode. Spatially encode because we're trying to figure out where this echo exists in space, right? That's why it's called spatial encoding. I tend to just use the word encode, but the official term for it is spatial encoding because we're trying to encode where the patient is coming from in space. Like where does it, not in time, but in space, right? This means that we alter the MR echo and put a code in the echo to determine where the echo came from, right? 
just like the ping in a rope in a sonar or a bat using echolocation to get that information back. Okay. Uh, once again, I'm going to open up the webinar questions. We're going to go on break till five minutes past the hour. Give me just a minute to open them up here. They will be on Moodle under week three. Once again, it does not matter what you score on the webinar questions, only that you complete them right now and not like in two hours or two days from now. All right. You can, once again, you can see your answers right after you take the webinar questions. You can take it again if you want to. I will not even look at what grade you make. It is a feedback tool for you to use and see uh, how you are doing on the lecture so far. Look at the questions. You don't have to share your screen while you do them. All right, and then like I said, we'll be back at five minutes past the hour. We'll go over the webinar questions and keep going from there.
All right, everybody, let us go over these webinar questions. We'll get right back into it. All right, gradient polarity and strength is determined by the amount of electricity flowing in wires around the magnet. So the polarity and the strength. Polarity, positive or negative direction, which way is it going? And then strength is, is it a steep or shallow gradient? Gradient works by adding a magnetic force. Yep. Subtracting magnetic force from the main magnetic field. Yep. And changing the precessional frequency of protons. Absolutely. Spatial resolution is determined by the gradients. Uh, we haven't really gotten to resolution yet. We'll, we'll get to resolution in a minute. So that one was a little confusing. The slope of the gradient determines its strength of the magnetic force. Slope is the strength of the force. Nothing to do with the strength of the RF pulse or the speed of the scan. Two types of gradients are physical and logical. All right. Let's keep going from there. Okay, so we're going to start by talking about the slice select gradient. The slice select gradient is what aims RF energy in the body. So when we talk about in MRI a slice, right, inside of patients, we create slices that end up creating images. Okay, so as we get further into our talk about MRI here, we need to start considering the different domains that we're looking at. We're talking sometimes about what's happening inside of the magnet with the patient, and then sometimes we're talking about what's happening on the image inside the computer, right? So we have what's happening in the patient and what's happening inside of the computer and how those two things translate to each other, all right? One of the first things we want to consider here. Inside of the patient, there is a slice. Each slice becomes an image. Slice exists in a, inside the machine, inside the patient. The image exists in the computer on your screen. Doesn't mean they're different things, right? For instance, you are watching a video of me, but I am a real person, right? So over here in my office, I am a real person, and you're seeing an image of me. The slice is the person. The MRI image is what you see on the screen. Okay. Sorry, I'm grab a book real quick. The way I like to think about this is that if our slice is an area inside of the patient, and we take that slice and then we can press it down and turn it into a two-dimensional picture on the screen. So a slice is the area in the patient that we're scanning the patient, and then the slice turns into an image. If I have 20 slices, I will end up with 20 images, right? Because each slice becomes an image. The way that we do this is we control where resonance occurs in the body. Resonance, if we didn't turn on a gradient and we put RF energy into the patient and the RF energy matched the processional frequency of the patient, the conditions for resonance exist, energy transfers into the patient, excitation occurs. But that doesn't happen across the entire patient. It only happens inside of one particular slice. And then once we collect enough information from that slice, we go on to the next slice. So if I have 20 slices, then for slice number one, I will come here and collect information and only excite the protons in this slice. The rest of the protons in the body do not become excited. So the area of the patient that is becoming excited is the slice. We create the slice with a gradient. 
So, we think about it like this. Here's our patient. My horrible drawing of a patient. There's the head. There's the foot. Not even feet. I'm just going foot. Yeah. When we turn on a gradient, this is our isocenter. We alter processional frequency. Now these protons are going faster and these protons are going slower because this is the positive end of the magnet and this is the negative. So we know that resonance occurs when processional frequency equals the frequency of the RF pulse. When those two things are equal, we get resonance. So when we're scanning a patient, we now turn on change processional frequency and we say, okay, in this part of the patient's body, let's say this end of the, of the uh, slice is at 42 megahertz. And this end over here is at 42.5. So because this gradient is going across this part of the body, the protons at this side of that line are going at 42. And then in between these two lines, the protons are all going between 42 and 42.5 megahertz. If I send in my RF pulse, and I send in RF pulses between 42 and 42.5 megahertz, then only these protons become excited. These text boxes. So only these protons, resonance occurs, which means only these protons get pushed down into the transverse plate. The rest of the, well, these protons get pushed down into the transverse plate. All of these protons outside of this area do not get excited and they stay in the same direction as B sub zero. They all stay in the longitudinal plane. So an MRI, what a slice is, is we'll turn on one of our physical gradients and then we'll put in RF energy in a range that matches the area we want to be the slice. Yes, and that is called a bandwidth because a bandwidth is a, very, is a bunch of different um, uh, frequencies. And that's what we call a bandwidth in MRI. So that's how we create a slice. So gradients alter processional frequency of protons. Resonance only occurs when the processional frequency of protons is the same as the frequency of the RF pulse. So slice selection happens when the slice select gradient alters the processional frequencies of protons. So resonance only happen in one place in the body. The area that experienced resonance is what we call the slice. So that is what the slice select gradient does. When one of the gradients, X, Y, or Z, does the job of slice select, it is turning on and changing processional frequency. Then we choose that RF energy that only matches the protons, the processional frequencies of protons in the slice. Only those protons are pushed from the longitudinal plane into the transverse plane. So only those protons make the signal. All of the protons outside of that slice, they don't experience resonance. The RF energy just passes right through those protons and they don't interact with them. Though so RF energy is blasted across the whole body, the whole body gets affected by RF energy. But the RF energy doesn't match the processional frequency of all of the protons outside of the slice. So nothing happens. 
That RF energy just goes past those protons, waves on its way, and then nothing happens. But in the slice, the protons get excited. So when we're making an MRI image, when you place those, I hope everybody in clinical has seen where they have the lines they're placing over the patient, right? Where you place those lines is telling the machine how strong the gradient needs to be and what RF energy needs to be used to create those slices, All right? Go ahead, Kathleen. If 42.58 is a constant that um, hydrogen atoms are at when we're talking about like the Larmor equation and stuff like that, mm -hmm. how is it not affecting the rest of the body if, the, if it's a constant like that? So that constant is, if you take that constant and you multiply it by the magnetic force, that tells you what the precessional frequency is. So when a, if you're on a one Tesla magnet and the patient goes into the magnet, then their entire body is at 42.56 until you change the strength of the magnet. Once you change the strength of the magnet, now it depends, because that's what the Larmor equation tells us. You take the gyromagnetic ratio, you multiply it by the strength of the magnetic force, and that tells you the new precessional frequency. So the gradients are turning on and changing precessional frequency and altering it. Yeah. Yeah, the gradients change the entire body when they're turned on. Yes. Are we setting the patient's slice of the body to a different RF, and then we shoot RF to create resonance? Yes. Yes. It, I mean, both things are true. When you turn on the gradient, it makes all the protons in this part in, in your slice resonate, and it makes all the protons outside of the slice not resonate because that's how we generate a slice. We generate a slice by controlling processional frequency. We control processional frequency through altering the magnetic force. So now going back to the physical gradients, there are three physical gradients inside of the machine. These are their directions. The Z gradient, once again, think of the patient as laying down in here. Again, that's the head. The Z gradient goes in the direction from the foot to the head. Or inferior to superior. The Y gradient goes from the back of the patient to the front of the patient, or anterior to posterior. And the X gradient goes from the left to the right of the patient, or lateral to medial. Those are, you know, our technical, you know, names for those things. So when I want to make a certain type of slices, then I have to choose a certain physical gradient to do the job of slice select. When I want to make axial slices, only the gradient that changes magnetization from foot to head can be used to make those axial slices. When I want to make coronal slices, then the Y gradient is the only gradient that can turn on that will change the strength from anterior to posterior. And when I want to make sagittal slices, only the X gradient can turn on and change the magnetization from left to right or lateral to medial. Now, the slice select gradient is a bit different from all the other gradients because you don't see the effects of slice select on the final image. Why is that? The slice is a three-dimensional object. It's a slice out of the patient. But it can, gets turned into a two-dimensional picture. Right. We're going to talk about frequency and phase encoding, and we'll, we'll come back to that idea in just a second. There's something you need to know for the quiz. And here it is right here on a little chart. 
to help you out. If I ran a pull sequence and it was a sagittal pull sequence, which physical gradient would have to do the job of slice select? And the answer is X. If I ran a pull sequence and it was coronal, which physical gradient had to do the job of slice select? It's Y. And for axial, it's Z. All right. Exactly. So, which gradient, which physical gradient gets the job, gets assigned the job of slice select depends on the orientation of your slices. And orientation of your slices is what we mean by axial sagittal coronal. That's the orientation of slices. So when it comes to determining which physical gradient, X, Y, or Z, it depends on the orientation of the slices. Are they axial, sagittals, or coronal? On top of that, slices have a thickness to them. I can make a thinner slice, or I can make a thicker slice. The thickness of the slice is very simply how much of the body are you turning in to one image. Now, this is really important because the more the thicker and thicker the slice becomes, I'm taking more and more of the patient's anatomy and squishing it down into a single picture. So a really thick slice takes a lot of their anatomy, but all of that anatomy has to be pushed together into one image. So as it, yes, that's exactly right, Viviana, if I'm saying your name right, sorry if I'm not. Yes, you lose resolution when you get a thicker slice because the image is going to start to get blurrier because I'm taking more things and trying to compress them down into a single image. Imagine if you took a flower and you smashed it in a book and you let it sit there. Then you have a nice smashed flower. Imagine if you took a massive handful of flowers and smashed them all together in a book. It may be harder to see an individual flower because it may be smushed in the middle of everything else. Not time. Not time. Slice thickness is not a time component. We talk about time next week, but it's not a component of time. A thicker or thinner slice does not take you more time. So here, we have a 2 millimeter slice, and here we have a 20 millimeter slice. So we simply have more of the patient's body that we have to smash down into a picture. So now it's all of these different things. You think of it a bunch of different layers that are all smashing down together. They start to blur each other out. And the term partial volume artifact is what happens when we have really bad resolution. Because now if there's a little tiny pathology in the patient there, well, over here, it may be smashed with so much of the anatomy that it doesn't even show up on the image. And over here on the thin slice, you can see it, but on the thick slice, it's completely disappeared because the slice was super thick. So a lot of different anatomy got pushed together, and now you can't see what's wrong with the patient. The negative of thin slices is something called um, is a is is not time not time. It's something called SNR signal to noise ratio. Makes the noise we get less signal. When we're doing MRI images, sometimes we get noise in the image. But a big thick volume, big thick uh, slice, gives you more anatomy, which actually gives you more. Let's take a look. I'm gonna we're not gonna go too far into SNR because we go into it next week, but. This is not images based on slice thickness, but it is also resolution. It's the matrix we're about to get into. But this side of the image, this is a image with low SNR. Do you see all that graininess that's all over it? That's what happens when your slice gets too thin. 
That's what happens when your slice gets too thin. When your slice gets too thick, it gets, oops. It gets blurry. So too thin, we lose uh, noise, right? Too thick, we lose resolution. This is a big part of being an MR tech. We are balancing. We have four things we're always balancing in MRI. Contrast, resolution, SNR, and time. All right. Those four things always affect how we scan. So when we look at this image, you'll see where we have blurred images. And over here, we have grainy images. And in the middle, we have the acceptable range, right? The Goldilocks concept. This one's too hot. This one's too cold. This one's just right. And we're constantly trying to balance things. We do not want noise. We do not want noise. It is a signal to noise ratio. We want lots of signal, very little noise. Thicker slices have worse resolution. Yes. Why do we not always use thin slices? Because then we lose the SNR. Like I said, we're going to go deep into SNR next week um, just because I can only teach so much in one week. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard these first three weeks because there's like so many overlapping concepts and it's hard to like get them all out at once. All right. Okay. So slices have a thickness. They excite a volume of tissue for the patient. So volume of tissue, we're thinking just, uh, yeah, it's just graininess in the pictures. It's just graininess in the pictures. That's what noise is. But like I said, I don't want to get too far into it just because I have time next week and I don't have time this week. And I, I've got I've, I've to pick and choose what we learn here, right? But yeah, noise, the way I like to think of noise is imagine you were driving, once again, listening to a car radio. When you're right next to the to the radio tower, you hear the music really well. But as you start to drive farther and farther away from that radio tower, it starts to crackly and it starts to go and you start to hear more and more noise in your signal. Right? That's what SNR can be thought of. Right? As you get more noise, you start to lose that signal. And like I said, that graininess, that's what noise looks like on an image. A bunch of little graininess. Kind of like an old TV that had the rabbit ears. And it's got a bunch of fuzz over it, that's noise as well. Those are all examples of signal to noise, right? Too thin, no, too thin, we get a lot of noise. Too thick, we lose resolution. Yep. Lots of signal or resolution. Better resolution or signal. Which one do we want to use? And it depends a lot of times, like our slice thickness is usually dependent on the body part. If I want to scan a pituitary, which is a tiny little gland in the middle of your head, it's really small. I need some thin slices. If I want to scan my humerus, things freaking huge. Oh, I mean, the humerus itself is huge, right? Which means you can afford to use big slices. So it's usually the size of the pathology we're looking for. So volume of tissue, that just means how much of the, of the patient are we scanning? A thick slice is a big volume, a thin slice is a little volume. Slice thickness determines if more or less of the patient's volume of tissue is excited during an exam. Slice thickness is a parameter that we can choose on the machine. It's one of our parameters. Now, I, I keep meaning to take this out of the lecture. Don't worry about the transmit bandwidth stuff. We're not going over it in this class. So a thin slice requires a steep slope. So as I use a steeper gradient, I get a thinner slice. Because I'm using stronger magnetic forces, I can fine tune and get a really thin slice because I have more differences in processional frequency. A shallow gradient creates a thick slice. So. Yeah, yeah, like Mike's saying, the, the slice thickness is almost always set by the rad. The rad is like, I want three millimeter slices for this one, or I want two millimeters, or I want five millimeters. So yeah, usually we don't even get to choose slice thickness. I know some places where texts do change a little bit, but most of the time it's one of those things we don't get to choose. So when you're on the computer, there's a thing that says slice thickness, 
like two millimeters, when you change that, you are telling the computer when it scans the patient what steepness of gradient to use. As I change that slice thickness number, when the scan gets run, that's going to determine what steepness of the gradient is used. What is the thinnest possible slice you can use? That depends on the strength of the gradients on your machine. Yeah, Joseph, it's usually just set for the exam. Usually the docs are just like, I want to see this, this thickness on a patient. So like every shoulder you run, maybe three millimeter slices. But then every pituitary you run, maybe like one millimeter slices. Next thing we know, need to know about these gradients is they turn on and turn off at certain times during the pulse sequence. Once again, remember, we're building our way up to understand what a pulse sequence is here. But if we look at the word pulse sequence, what does it mean? The pulses are RF pulses and gradient pulses. And we want to know the sequence in which they happen. Everything we run in MRI is a pulse sequence. T1 weighted fast spin echo, sagittal T2 weighted gradient, T2 star weighted gradient echo. That Those are all one set of images is a pulse sequence. This is a pulse sequence diagram. This tells us the order in which pulses are happening. A lot of crazy things on this lecture. The things that are happening on the pulse sequence diagram are going to be most of the things you're going to see on the quiz. All right. So, and also the orientation. This is the slice select gradient. When we look at this pulse sequence diagram, what we're looking at here is that when this goes up, that means the gradient is turned on in the positive direction. When it goes down, it's in the negative. Notice that for the slice select gradient, it is turned on at the same time as the 180 and the 90 degree RF poles. I can tell you like these two quiz answers can be answered with the following statement. The slice select gradient turns on any time you're putting RF energy into the patient. Every time RF energy is going into the patient, the slice select gradient is turned on. You never use RF energy without the slice select gradient being turned on. And you never turn on the slice select gradient without putting RF energy into the patient. They are married. They go together always and forever. There's no exceptions to that rule. There's a lot of exceptions to rules in MRI. This one has not. The slice select gradient aims the RF energy so that it only hits the part of the patient we're trying to scan at that point in time, the slice. If we can, you turn on can you repeat that, please? Yes. So slice select gradient and the RF energy always happen at the same time. The slice select gradient determines where the RF energy goes. I think about it, the, R, the slice select gradient aims the RF energy, right? If I had a water gun and I was trying to shoot someone, I would have to aim at them and then shoot the water. The gradient aims, the RF energy is what we're shooting into the patient. If you didn't turn on Sure, if you want to think of that way, whatever analogy works for you. Um, if you don't turn on the slice select gradient, the entire body would experience resonance because it would all have the same processional frequency. And your slice thickness would be the thickness of the entire body. Not useful. And if you turned on the slice select gradient and you wouldn't be putting RF energy into the patient, right? Then guess what? It wouldn't do anything. 
We turn on the slice select gradient, and then we turn it off, and nothing would happen. All right, y'all, don't, don't get too far off now. Don't get too far off topic in the, in the chat here. Okay, so slice select gradient and RF energy. They are always happening at the same time. I'm going to give you a quiz answer right now. Which of the following gradients is turned on while you're putting RF energy into the patient? Slice select, frequency, or phase encoding? Answer is slice select. All right? I'm telling you right now, these are the quiz questions, people. All right. The slice select gradient is turned on the, at the same time as the RF excitation pulse. The slice select gradient must also be turned on at the same time as the RF rephasing pulse. Every time we are using RF energy, the slice select gradient is turned on. All right. Phase encoding. So now we've excited the slices. We've excited the protons only inside the slice. We have two other forms of encoding that we have to accomplish to figure out where everything is on the image. animation here. Okay, so in this example, we're going to be looking at nine different protons inside of the patient's body. Can everybody see my screen? I've been having problems with sharing, so I just want to make sure before I start. All right, y'all can see it? Okay, cool. So here's the problem. These are the protons inside of the slice, all right? All of these protons have already been excited. They're in the transverse plane. But now the computer needs to be able to tell where all of those protons are going. It needs to be able to say where those protons go on the image. Remember, these protons exist inside of the patient. The problem we have is we need the computer to know where they are so that it can make an image of the patient, right? So what we can do is we can alter the phase of the protons. So when I turn on the phase encoding gradient, I alter processional frequency. Look at the top row of protons. I can't draw on this. Do you see the direction in which the top row of protons are pointing? Notice the middle row are pointing in a different direction. And the protons at the bottom are pointing in a different direction as well. So when we talked about phase last week, we talked about how phase is the difference of where protons are pointing. If I change processional frequency, and if you see the gradient right there, that symbol right there up top, right? That's the gradient, the pink triangles. There's the positive side up top, making magnetic force stronger. In the middle, you can see magnetic force is not changed, isocenter. And down here, the gradient has made the magnetic field slower. Which means when the gradient turned on, protons in the positive side of the gradient started moving faster, and protons on the negative side started moving slower. When I turn off the gradient, all the protons go back to the same processional frequency, right? But the difference in phase stays. So if we had three cars, they were all driving the same speed down a road. And then I say, okay, car number one, you start going faster. Car number two, you keep going the same speed. And car number three, you slow down, right? We'll say all three cars are going 50 miles an hour. First car is gonna accelerate to 70 miles an hour. Middle car will stay at 50 miles an hour. And the third car will slow down to 30 miles an hour. I do that for a minute. And then I tell all the cars, go back to 50 miles an hour now. Those three cars, even though they're now all going 50 miles an hour, the car that went 70 for a little bit is going to be farther up. And the car that went 30 is going to be farther behind. So the three cars started going the same speed and they were all at the exact same spot. 
Then wind went faster, one went slower, and then they started going 50 miles an hour again, but they're still not next to each other, right? Because the faster ones are going to be farther ahead. The ones that didn't change their speed will be at the same spot. And the ones that slowed down will now be farther behind. So the phase encoding gradient turns on, processional frequency gets altered, and when processional frequency got altered, that changed the phase. Now, when I turn the gradient off, all the protons go back to the same processional frequency, but the difference in where they're pointing stays. The car going that went 70 miles an hour a little bit, it stays ahead of the other car because now they're all going the same speed again. So the three cars are now one, two, three, even though they started lined up at 50 miles an hour and they ended up going 50 miles an hour, they're all in different spots from each other. Now, when the computer reads the image, it knows that any of the protons at here on the patient was in the top part of the patient. So these protons have to go at the top of the image. These protons were in the middle of the patient, so they have to go to the middle of the image. And these protons were down here, so they have to go to the bottom of the image. So by altering the phase of the protons, that will change the echo. The different phase of these protons will create different codes inside of the echo in coding. Let's take a look at that real quick. So you can see here, these different shapes are coming from the different protons. The computer can read these different echoes. Sorry, this animation goes really fast. Can look at these different shapes, and that's where the encoding is coming from. The strength of the gradient is altering them. Right? You can see here, the three lines of the echo are very close to each other. Here, they're farther apart, and here, they're really far apart. That's because this had a shallow gradient, then a steeper gradient, then the steepest gradient. The computer can read that and turn and tell now where those protons are supposed to go in the, on the image. It says, that's where the protons were in the patient. Now I can tell where those are supposed to go on the final image. Once again, this is the idea of encoding. The gradient turns on, changes phase. That change in phase, based on, remember, we're talking about why the phase changes based on where the patient is. If the patient, if we're doing a head and the patient's at ISO center, then the gradient's making these protons faster and these ones slower. That change in phase creates a different looking echo, which the computer can read and then say, okay, cool. Those protons were going how they had what phase? That means it goes over here. That ear belongs here on the image. Okay, now the gradient turned on and these protons were going slower. Okay, how slow were they going? That means it goes here. So the gradient is trans is using processional frequency to tell the computer where those protons go. All right. But we still have a problem here. We may know where everything goes in the top of the image, right? We know where everything goes at the top or the middle of the bottom, but we don't know left to right. So I know the top row goes here, but how do I know that this belongs here, that the protons on this part of my head belong over here? You know, if this was my this part of my face, how do I know it goes here and not here and not here? Because these all look the same. To figure that out, we will now do our second way of encoding, which is frequency encoding. So once again, three-dimensional object. I have to figure out where everything in this picture is from top to bottom and from left to right. In this case, phase encoding is telling us top to bottom. It's telling me that my eyes go here and that my nose goes here and my mouth goes here. But we still have to figure out left to right where is everything supposed to go. Because if you say my eyes go here, how do I know the left eye goes over here and the right eye goes over there? So we always have two different encoding directions. Frequency and phase. Now, frequency encoding happens when we collect the echo. 
So while the echo is being formed, we turn on the frequency encoding gradient. And in this one, all the protons have the same frequency because no other gradients are turned on. And then we turn it on. Now, I have to hit this one play. But watch how protons over here go slower, medium, and then faster. So these protons are going faster. These are going slower. And, or, and the, the ones at the end are going the slowest. Right? So while the echo is being generated, we're altering phase. And now we know if protons are going at this speed, at this frequency, or if protons are going at the middle frequency, or if protons are going at the highest frequency across the gradient, once again, this puts a code in the echo. So the three lines of, of protons, the top, the bottom, and the middle were separated by their phase. And the left, the middle, and the right were separated by their frequency. Which means no two of these nine protons had both the same phase and frequency information. Which means if the computer wants to tell me where any one of these protons are coming from, it just has to read the echo and say, okay, according to the phase, the proton goes here, and according to the frequency, it goes here. That proton was the eye. Okay, according to the phase, the proton went here, and according to the frequency, the proton went here. That's this side of the phase. So, a phase direction, a phase encoding, and a frequency encoding. We already figured out slice. That's this direction. This is your slice select direction. So, three directions inside of the patient. Inferior to superior, lateral to medial, anterior to posterior. Three physical gradients. Z, X, Y. Those three gradients are given three jobs. Slice select, phase encoding, frequency encoding. That information is encoded into the echo, decoded by the computer, and turned into the picture. So how we locate something in the body is by using these gradients to alter processional frequency. All right. That's what we're going for here. All right, the second method of phase encoding of, of encoding is phase encoding. Phase encoding happens after the protons have been excited. We're going to look at the pull sequence diagram here in a minute as well. When a gradient turns on and alters processional frequency, it also alters the phase of the protons. So once again, if we have protons and we turn on this gradient, we are making this part of the gradient stronger, which increases processional frequency. This part of the gradient is going slow, is weaker magnetic force, slowing processional frequency. And isocenter starts the same. So just like our car that was going faster for a little bit, and then we went and went back to normal speed, it's going to be farther ahead than the other ones. Protons at isocenter will have the same phase that they did because they're unaffected. And protons on this side of isocenter will be going slower. So now all three of these protons have a different amount of phase based on, oops, based on where they are along the gradient, right? The computer can say, okay, the proton had this phase. That means it was a couple centimeters away from isocenter in this direction or so many centimeters or millimeters away from isocenter in that direction. Whenever we alter processional frequency, phase is also affected as a byproduct, right? Phase is also affected. The steeper our gradient is, the bigger what we call a phase shift. 
meaning the more these protons are out of phase with each other. The shallower the gradient, the more in phase and the less out of phase the protons are. Right? This is just like slice thickness, where I use a steeper gradient, I get that better resolution, but I start killing my SNR. Right? Same thing. Steeper gradient, better resolution. Now, the phase encoding is used to make every echo unique. Each echo must be unique so that it, the signal will be different, so we know where it's coming from. The difference in signals is what allows the machine to locate where the echo is coming from in the body. Steeper gradients make bigger phase shifts, while shallower gradients make smaller phase shifts. Phase encoding must happen between the 90 and the 180 degree RF pulses. It has to happen after we have excited the protons, but before we rephase them. RF energy always happens with the slice select, but phase encoding happens all by itself between the 90 and the 180. That's another quiz question. Phase encoding gradient turns on after the excitation pulse, but before the rephasing pulse. This allows the gradient to alter the phase of protons before they are rephased and generate an echo. We can't change their phase before they've been excited because they're not in the transverse plane yet. We can't change their phase after we rephase them. Because now they're rephasing and it's too late. The phase shift is encoded into the echo, and the MRI machine can decode the echo and locate the source of the echo. So that remember, phase shift just means how how out of phase are those protons? Are they really out of phase with a big shift or not so out of phase? Yes, which question? Um, would this have anything to do with the TR and TE time? Like, would that affect the phase encoding? No. 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 The only thing that could possibly, I mean, no, it will not. It will not. The only thing it could poss that it possibly affects is the shortest TE possible. Because if the shortest TE possible that we could use we can't turn this on while the phase encoding is happening. So if I wanted to use a really short TE value, then the shortest TE value I can use is the fastest I can do this, and then do this, and then do this, and then do this. And when I'm making a T1 weighted sequence, that's what we're doing. We want a short TE. So we have to cram these things, but they can't overlap. We can't have the phase encoding gradient turn on while the slice select gradient is still turning on. Because if we change the magnetic force in this direction and this direction, then they add up together and we change it in this direction and we get nothing but artifacts. That's the only thing it will affect. Okay, uh, let's take a break till five minutes past the hour and we're going to keep going. Usually I try to do the lectures in under two hours, but encoding and probably case space next week, we're going to have to go late. Sorry, it's just. These are the most complicated issues we have. It gets better. I promise this is the hardest lecture. Next week's the second hardest. But after that, I promise, it gets a little bit easier. All right, five minutes after us.
Okay. So let's finish our talk on frequency encoding here. All right. So last gradient is frequency encoding. This gradient is turned on during the collection of the echo. Frequency encoding gradient changes processional frequency across the magnetic field while the protons are being rephased into the echo. So once again, pulse sequence, the sequence of pulses, we need to know the sequence of the pulses, right? Frequency encoding gradient is turned on while the echo is being generated. So frequency encoding locates each part of the echo as it's generated. The MRI can now tell what part of the echo came from, and frequency is the opposite direction of phase encoding. Every single image you have will have phase encoding in one direction and frequency encoding in the other. And you can swap these, usually to get rid of artifacts. So frequency encoding happens here when the echo is being generated, right? So RF energy happens with the slice select gradient. Phase encoding happens between the two RF pulses. And the frequency encoding gradient is turned on while the echo is being generated. We have to turn on the frequency encoding while the echo is being generated because when we turn on a gradient, it changes frequency. But when we turn off the gradient, frequency goes back to the main magnetic field. So if we want the change in frequency from the frequency encoding gradient to show up in the echo, then we have to turn it on while the echo is being generated. The slice select gradient just aims the RF energy for us. Phase encoding works because we can turn on the phase encoding gradient, alter the phase, turn off the phase encoding gradient, and the change in phase stays. But when I turn on a gradient and it changes frequency, as soon as I turn off the gradient, that change in frequency disappears. So if I want a change in frequency to show up in my echo, then I have to keep it turned on while I'm reading the echo and collecting the echo. That's why the frequency encoding gradient has to turn on while the echo is being generated. Because otherwise, the change in frequency won't get encoded into the echo. So, why do we care? Why do we care? Right, that's what we're going to deal with next. What does this relate to us? How does this affect our parameters? How does this affect how we scan? That's what we're going to talk about next. We already talked a little bit about this because we talked about slice thickness, right? And slice thickness uh, helps determine resolution, and that determines the uh, steepness of the slope of the slice select gradient. All right, so, open this up real quick. Let's talk about the matrix. I'm not talking about the Keanu Reeves, Keanu Reeves movies. We are talking about the matrix of the image is the pixels that are in the image. I'm gonna pull up an MRI image here real quick. All right, so we're going to take a look at some MRI images here. Oh, it's got motion on it. All right, so this is an elbow, a misoriented elbow, but we'll still let that slide. We're going to go and zoom in. So if I zoom way in, as far as I possibly can on this MRI image, you'll start to notice that you can start to see there are tiny little boxes all over this thing, right? 
you start to see that. Let's see if I can find a slice that shows this really good. That these are all tiny little boxes here that make up this whole image. Every MRI image is made up of pixels. Right. A pixel is a picture element. That's what it stands for. Your computer screen is made up of pixels. All screens are made up of pixels. Tiny little dots of light that when you zoom out of them, make a picture, right? Uh, you may have seen some of the paintings that are all a bunch of dots. And if you're really close, you can't see what it is. But if you back up, it becomes a picture you can clearly see. That's what pixels are. So in MRI, all of these different pixels all come from encoding. Where each one of these pixels is and the size of each one of these pixels is completely based on encoding factors. You can see them a little bit better here. So all of these little pixels are determined by the gradients, the frequency and the phase gradient. That is what a pixel is. Our matrix is all of the pixels together on the image. And when we zoom out, then we get our MRI image. We're going to come back to that. The frequency and phase encoding are what make up the matrix. Frequency and phase encoding happen to the patient inside of the MRI scanner. The matrix exists on the image on your screen, right? We do have to remember an image is a representation of the patient, but the gradients turning on and off, that's happening to something to the patient. The matrix is when we're talking about the image, right? So the matrix describes how we section off different parts of the MR image to spatially encode each. So the matrix is how we are cutting up our picture to make an image of it. Matrix is comprised of picture elements or pixel, PI for picture times EL. These pixels have certain black, white, or gray values based on tissues in the contrast, or the voxel or volume element. A voxel is a 3D thing that exists in the patient. A pixel is two-dimensional and exists on the image. What a voxel is, is if we take our slice and we cut it up into different cubes, then each one of those cubes is a voxel. And each voxel then becomes a pixel on the image. A voxel is a three-dimensional element. It is a cube. Whereas a pixel is a two-dimensional element. It is a square. Once again, patients are three-dimensional, images are two-dimensional. We create voxels with encoding inside of the patient, and that directly relates to the pixels on the image. So when I have my slice, my slice gets cut up into a bunch of different voxels, and each voxel is then represented on the image as a pixel on the computer screen. All right. Here's another representation of the matrix. This is a slice out of a patient. Right? This is a slice out of a patient. In this case, the matrix would then correspond to an MRI image 
with a bunch of pixels. And we would have one pixel for every voxel. This exists in the patients because it's a three-dimensional object. And then the image is on your screen. When the computer does encoding, it's telling us where each one of these voxels are and where it belongs on the image. It says, okay, this we're going to encode certain parts of the echo. The computer then decodes it and creates a pixel on the image for whatever is inside of that voxel. Right, so once again, this is the patient. Let's say this is a patient's hand. Frequency encoding and phase encoding is telling us this information is here. The computer then decodes it and can put that information onto the picture. And then it can copy the picture onto your image because of this process. Figure five, that's the figure we're just looking at. Each voxel that composes the, mo the matrix. This is a picture of a slice from an MR image. Each voxel is some tissue from the patient. We use the term volume in MRI. We're talking about the volume of tissue inside the patient. Each voxel has a corresponding pixel on the image, which is the front panel of the box. So this voxel, this part of the voxel ends up becoming the pixel. Pixel is 2D while a voxel is 3D. When the machine generates the MR image, it will read the amount of signal in each voxel and correspond that to the pixel. The machine will then assign a grayscale value to each pixel, right? Is it black? Is it white? Or is it some shade of gray? Based on the tissue in the voxel. What grayscale value each pixel get is contrast. Whether it's black, white, or gray is based on TR and TE. Is it a T2 weighted image and that voxel contains water? Then the corresponding pixel will be white. But if it's the exact same image, but it's T1 weighted, and that voxel still contains water, it will now be black. Where the voxel exists is a function of gradients doing encoding. What grayscale value, whether it's bright or dark, is a function of contrast. So the gradients tell us where the voxel is coming from and how big the voxel is. Contrast tells us whether it is white, black, or some shade of gray. Example, if it was a T1 weighted image and a voxel contained blood, the pixel would be black. If we reran the sl slice as a T2 weighted, then the pixel would now be bright. The amount of the signal each voxel is based on contrast parameters. We haven't gotten to TI or FA yet. Those will be in the following weeks. Those are parameters that are specific to certain pull sequences. And we'll cover those when we get to those pull sequences. So the frequency and fading uh, process is encoding of MR signals with information to identify which signals from the patient is assigned to each voxel. So this is how I think of frequency and phase encoding. So once again, we have the patient with their hand here. We have to be able to tell where all of these voxels are coming from. In this case, the phase direction tells us, yes, exactly. Battleship is usually what I use for this analogy. Yeah, exactly. The letter here, is based on the phase direction, A, B, C, or D. 
And then the frequency direction tells us one, two, three, or four. No two pixels, no two of these boxes have both the same letter and number. Each one has a unique amount of those, right? There's only one three C. There's many threes, there's many Cs, but only one box has three C in it. Only one box has four A. So while we're scanning the patient, the gradient, the phase encoding gradient, and the frequency encoding gradient alter phase and frequency, which then tells us where all the pixels are coming from. Now remember, on the image, there's no slice select direction because slice select is going in the way of the screen. The third dimension we can't see on our image is the slice select direction. So on this image here, left to right is the phase direction, up and down is the frequency direction, and the slice direction is the direction that you scroll through the slices. So where each one of these slices is, that's the slice direction. Phase is this direction, frequency is this direction, this is the slice direction. Three directions because it's a three-dimensional object. Slice direction tells us which slice we're in because only those protons got excited. Now you may notice there's motion here, right? This is what motion artifact looks like. Because what happened was the patient was moving while the phase encoding gradient turned on. And it screwed up the phase encoding. And that's why this signal is there. Because phase encoding wasn't done correctly. Because the computer turned on the phase, right? And it turned on the, the, the phase encoding gradient. And when it turned on the phase encoding gradient, that altered processional frequency. But the patient then moved their arm. And as they moved their arm, different parts of the arm got affected by different amounts of phase encoding. Because they're supposed to hold still. So that way the computer can say, okay, you hold still, I'll turn on the gradient. And if the gradient's stronger over here, that anatomy goes over here. If it's weaker over here, it goes over here. But if a patient's anatomy is moving while I'm changing phase, then it just screws everything up. And so the computer then just throws all this extra information because it's like, I don't know where it's supposed to go. I was trying to figure out where everything goes based on its speed, based on where it's located, but where it's located changed because the patient moved. And that's a problem. That's a phase encoding problem. Motion is directly caused by issues with phase encoding. Phase encoding didn't happen correctly. That's what motion artifact is. The artifacts we most commonly see are because of the phase. Let's take a look at another one real quick. This is called wrap. This is the patient's head. This is the front of their face and their nose and their mouth. This is the back of the patient's head, the part of the image that comes off of here. But because it was coming off the picture, the computer messed up the phase encoding and it put that part of the image in the wrong spot. So when encoding isn't done correctly, we get artifacts. Motion, wrap, these artifacts happen because phase encoding did not happen correctly. So the idea here is that the phase encoding and the frequency encoding tell us exactly where the right numbers go. If the wrong information gets put in the wrong one, usually due to motion or wrap, then, can, then the image gets messed up. It doesn't look right. 
it gets wrap, or you get motion artifact going across the image. Right. So if you mapped it out, it would look like a grid system with information in each space. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Sorry, I was not seeing the chat here. Thank you, Mike, for answering. I'm just going to look at it real quick. Yeah, so Jordan, a lot of these parameters are set. The So here's what here's why parameters are important. Because guess what? Patients aren't all the same. You have all these things set. You copy it from one sequence to the next sequence. You run a shoulder, fine. You don't change anything. Run the next shoulder, nothing changes. Suddenly, you get a linebacker. You get somebody whose shoulders are gargantuan. And suddenly your parameters don't fit that patient anymore, right? What do you do? You get a patient who doesn't fit within the shoulder coil. You got to go grab a different coil. Got to change your parameters. Can you do that? If you can't, then you are what we call a button pusher. You're like, I don't know how to do this. If you can, then you're a skilled tech. So you have to learn what all these things are so that when a wrench comes along and messes up your scanning, you know how to change it, right? So yes, a lot of times they're set. But guess what a lot of techs do? They open it up and they say, it's not how I scan. Do this, 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 this. You're like, why can't I just run it the way it came? It's because every tech thinks their kung fu is better than everybody else's, right? Including me. Right. see. So my facility system is basically dummy proof. Uh, until you get the patient who isn't the average patient. Until you get the patient who has Parkinson's disease. And now they have tremors and they can't stop moving. What do you do? Do you know what to do? Can you figure that out? No. That's the difference between a good tech and a okay tech. Oh, absolutely. And it's so annoying when you learn because so many people are saying, this is how I scan. But after you become a tech, you get to create your own style. Right. Or you get to scan at least the way you want to scan. Right. And like, you know, you don't have to change parameters. If you have your parameters really well built, then you don't have to change them unless, once again, things happen. Um, but once again, this all comes down to hex and the way that they like to scan. And right now, you have to learn like everybody's different way of scanning. But then you get to make up your own. And it's a lot more fun. Yeah, going to different machines, Joshua, can be really hard uh, because you have to learn everything twice. But the really good thing about that is that eventually, when you put that on your resume and you're trying to go find a job, you now have experience with two machines. Annoying right now, but really good on your resume later. Now, phase encoding and frequency are not always left to right and top to bottom. You can alter them and choose where they go on the image. And usually we do that because certain artifacts, like the motion artifact, that always goes in the phase direction. So sometimes we can't get rid of the motion, but swapping directions means the motion is no longer in the part we're trying to look at. So we do swap that. It's an option you can do is change your frequency and, and phase encoding. Um, um, yeah. And slice select is the only one that is stuck, right? If I say here, you're running an axial slice, which one is your phase and your frequency? I've not given you enough information to answer that question. But if I say you're running an axial, which gradient is your slice select, then it's the Z always. But you can't, like, just asking which one is the phase and frequency, that's not enough information to, to know that. Yeah, COPD patients can be really hard, especially when you're doing abdomens because they have to hold their breath. Yeah. Yeah, I change all my parameters too. Like, like that's, that's how I scan. Like, because my kung fu is better than everybody else's. Then you become the lead tech, and you get to save all your parameters in the scanner. And so when you open it up, it runs the way you want to. That's like part of being the lead tech. It's like everybody's got to mess with your parameters, because you can save parameters.
Yeah, swapping can also save time. Phase encoding takes longer. So if you have a rectangular field of view, you want the smaller area to be phased because phase takes extra time and frequency doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. So you can you can save time with that phase and frequency stuff. All right, I'm going to get back to the lecture. So I just saw there was some reason the chat, like with this many people, for some reason the chat, it used to like give like a little sound like ding every time there's a chat message. So I would know when popped up. I have to admit, Kevin, I wish that that feature was back, actually. What's that? The little ding when the yeah. chat is going on. I wish it would ding at me. It does it randomly now. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. I don't know. It's weird. But I, I liked it because it would stop and I could go and look. So I will, I will make sure to periodically check the chat. Oh, if it's closed, is that what it is? Then I'm closing. Hey, and I heard the yes, sir. Thank you, Eric. Learn new things every day. All right. Okay, so each box, so every every time we're scanning, every one of these pixels has to have a unique amount of phase or frequency. If it doesn't, we're getting artifacts, like motion, like wrap. And those are some of the most common artifacts you're going to see. So the chart below, we looked at this, see the matrix, we see how each one has different amounts of frequency of it. Another thing about naming conventions here, inside of the MRI scanner, we have phase encoding, because then we're talking about the gradient. But on the image, we call it the phase direction. Now those two things are directly linked, right? Whatever the phase encoding gradient is in the patient, that will be the phase direction on the image. And then the frequency encoding in the patient will be the frequency direction on the image. Once again, I'm just trying to help you all understand there's like, and it's all this physics, we have to understand what we're doing in the machine and then how that affects the image. So we need to like kind of talk about what domain are we talking about? Are we talking about the patient or are we talking about the image? Don't worry, next week we'll talk about case space, which is in the middle of those two things. If you're worried it's too simple, don't worry. Next week is coming. Okay, we don't get paid a lot of money because this stuff is simple. All right. So no two boxes have the same frequency value as the phase value, right? None of them have the same frequency and phase value, right? Some of them have the same frequency. Some of them have the same phase. But no two voxels or pixels have both same frequency and phase, right? They are all, there's only one 2A, there's only one 3D, and so on and so forth, right? So when the computer starts collecting echoes, it will know each pixel on your computer screen should be bright and also know where each pixel screen should go on your screen. Where the pixel goes on your screen is encoding. Whether that pixel is bright or not is contrast. Where? Gradients. Color? Contrast. Right? Brightness is contrast. Where the pixel go is the gradient. All right? These two things. So spatial encoding is what allows us to know that bright signal is areas for the fluid on T2 weighted or areas for the fat on T1 weighted. So how do we determine where the slice is coming from in the body? The slice select, which is the first thing we do, right? It's the first thing we do. Okay. Parameters. Again, out of the 15 questions on this week's quiz, five of them are going to be parameters, right? Frequency matrix and phase matrix. These are the actual things you change on your machine, right? When we're talking about parameters, we're talking about the numbers on the machine that you actually alter, okay? This determines how many pixels are in the frequency direction. And the phase matrix is how many pixels are in the phase direction. And then slice thickness is how thick the volume of tissue that is excited for each slice. Whenever we write the matrix, we always write it. Frequency matrix 
times phase matrix. If you need help remembering this, it's an alphabetical order. All right? So going back to this image we originally looked at, we can see the matrix values are listed at the top of each of these images. That means that this matrix was 128 pixels in the phase direction and 128 in the frequency. This one has 256 in the frequency and 256 in the phase. So, as we increase the number, we want more pixels in the same area. All of these images are the same size, right? They all cover the same amount of the patient. What the matrix is telling us is that with this size of a picture, how many boxes, how many pixels are we cutting it up into? All right. As I use less of the matrix, I am getting worse resolution. As I increase the matrix, my resolution gets better and better and better. The reason for this if this is my image, my matrix is two by two, then in the phase direction. I have one, two pixels. And in the frequency direction, I have one, two pixels. If I increase my matrix to four by four, well, I didn't change anything else, so all of my pixels had to get smaller. Yes, that's exactly why the localizer scan sucks. When you say this localizer scans suck, what you mean is that they are low resolution images. All right, just to be. Yes. And the reason that they are like that is because they run really fast. So you can see the outline of your anatomy without having to wait a long time. So the size of the pixel determines how sharp the image is. All right. We can think about this the same way we think about televisions and computer monitors. If we have a computer that is 1080p, your monitor is a 1080p, that means you have 1,080 pixels on the short edge of that monitor or television, whichever, or phone. If we now talk about a 4K television, that means we have 4,000 pixels on the small edge of that screen. So if I had two televisions that they were exact same size, they're both 32-inch televisions, and one's a 1080p and one's a 4K, the 4K has more pixels, which means they all must be smaller to fit on that same size screen. The smaller the pixels, the higher the resolution. 4K is a super sharp image where 180p is less. So as we add and increase this matrix number, we're squeezing more and more pixels and making them smaller and smaller on that image, making the resolution sharper. To do this, we use steeper and steeper gradients. As I increase that phase matrix and frequency matrix number, the computer says, oh, you need more, um, more pixels. That means I need to make stronger and stronger gradients to get those pixels smaller. So increasing the frequency matrix or increasing the phase matrix makes better resolution because those pixels get smaller and smaller. And that reason they get smaller and smaller 
is because when the pull sequence is running, we are using steeper and steeper and steeper gradients. So as the gradients get steeper, resolution improves. And like I said, next week, we're going to dig into the negative to that, which is a lowering of the signal noise, right? a lowering of the SNR, which once again, this grainy image is one with very poor uh, signal with very high amounts of noise. And as we go, the noise gets less, so we lose that graininess, but the image starts to become less and less sharp until the image gets too blurry because we've lost too much resolution. Right? So once again, we're a Goldilocks situation. We don't want it to be too blurry. We don't want it to be too grainy. We want it to be just right. Now we can do something called NSA and EX or averages. And if we wanted to have an image with a very high matrix and have it a good signal, we can pay the price of time. And we'll talk more about that next week because time is the other dimension we haven't talked about here. And next week we talk about both time and SNR. And then we'll finish talking about the four aspects of the MRI scheme. We're we'll talking about more next week. Parameters. Increasing the frequency matrix increases resolution. Increasing the phase matrix increases resolution. Decreasing the frequency matrix decreases resolution. Decreasing the phase matrix decreases resolution. Now, image, now slice thickness gets a little more confusing simply because a thicker slice gives us worse resolution. So, phase matrix goes up, good for resolution. Frequency matrix goes up, good for resolution. But when a slice gets thicker, so when the slice thickness number goes up, we actually get worse resolution. This is that whole TR and TE thing, right? Longer TR, more T1 contrast. Longer, T, or longer TR, less T1 contrast. Longer TE, more T2 contrast. So make sure you understand slice thickness. Is that. Now, all of those things that we're describing how thick these slices are getting. As it gets thicker, as the pixels get bigger, your image gets blurrier and blurrier and blurrier. We want to keep the voxel small. The matrix determines the size of the pixel. And if we add slice thickness there, then we're talking about the voxel. All right. Because once again, you don't see slice thickness on the on the image, right? That's just the, which slice we're in. So the kind of questions you're going to see on the quiz are something like you change your frequency matrix from 224 to 256. I'm trying to say 56. There we go. What happened to resolution? Yes, more resolution. It increased. It increased. I go from a TR of 600 to 1,000. What happened to resolution? Yes, nothing happened to resolution. Nothing happened to resolution. The only thing that happened is we have less T1 contrast. All right. I say this because once we get to the midterm, my parameter questions are going to be TR increases. Or there are going to be questions that are about contrast. Like what happens? T1 goes up, T2 goes up, T1 goes down, T2 goes down. You increase your frequency matrix. What happens to contrast? And the answer is nothing. Those are the questions students miss the most. We're not quite there yet. So before we go, I want to I want to pull it full circle and go back to this one thing we looked at 
at the very beginning, and then we will be done. I know this is a long one this week, and next week will probably be a little bit longer too. But then after that, we'll we'll get a little bit a little bit faster with these. Just this this gradient and the case based stuff next week are uh, hard subjects. We spend three weeks on this stuff in physics. We get a lot more in depth with it. So try to remember when we look at the image again, if we were to rem completely remove the resolution and we were to only be talking about contrast, this is what our image would look like, All right? That is an image that only has contrast. There's no sharp lines. There's just areas of dark, gray, and black. This is what RF pulses. TR and TE determines what areas are dark, which areas are black. And an area with no contrast would look like this. We don't have lots of shades of gray. We just have sharp outlines of things. It's kind of like a paint by numbers. The gradients give us the outline of the paint by numbers, and then TR and T go back and tell us what color everything should be. One last thing I want to show. This is an axial T1 weighted, sorry, axial proton density fat sat elbow. This is an axial T1 weighted elbow. These two images have the exact same gradient information. They have the same slice thickness. They have the same... Um, frequency matrix and phase matrix. There is no di resolution difference between this image and this image. The contrast is different. The TE and TR values are very different. But the resolution is the exact same. Just like this image, which is a coronal of the elbow, has the exact same contrast as the axial, but very different resolution. Different slice thickness, different orientation, different phase, different frequency matrix. So this has the same contrast as this one. Contrast is the same. What's dark and what's bright is the same, but very different gradient information. Whereas this axial and this axial, when I click on them, you can see they, they're exactly the same. Same frequency, same phase. Different TR, different TE means that they what's bright and what's dark is very different. But if I compare this to the coronal, very different gradient information, but the same TR and TE values. So a lot of times when we scan, you'll notice that you copy information from one scan to the next scan because you're copying the gradient information. If I run a coronal, if I set up my coronals, the second set of coronals, I simply copy all of the, of the gradient information where the slices are, what the matrix is. That gets copied from one set of images to the next. So I can have two sets of images with the same contrast, but different, but different resolution. And then sometimes we make images with the same resolution, but different contrast. We run two axials. Both axials have the exact same gradient information, same slice thickness, same placement of the slice, same matrix. But the TR and T are different, so they look totally different. So when we're making pole sequences in MRI, what we're deciding here a lot of times is we're setting up gradient information to give us, obviously, the resolution. And then we're setting up the TR and TE to give us the correct contrast. We usually run multiple different orientations and multiple different contrasts. Two axials with different contrasts. 
but then an axial and a coronal with the same contrast. All right. Okay. Like when you run things, the resolution is way different. Yes. And as you get it, as the slices get thinner, you want to see a slice with really bad resolution. And we look at our localizer or scout, if you want to call it that. Why does this look so much different? Because the resolution's way off. Because I wanted to run it in 30 seconds. So I could simply set up my three minute sequence without clipping anything and missing anything. Right? You can even look at a calibration scan. We'll get into calibration scans much later. You can't even see anything in here because this is all just for the computer. All right. Well, congratulations. You have made it through what I consider to be the hardest subject in MRI. Next week is the second hardest. But if you can get these first three weeks done, everything else we talk about is simply a variation of these things. All right. Everything we just talk about, okay, then we'll talk about gradient echoes. Here's how contrast is a little different. Here's how phase encoding is a little different. For the quiz, study the parameters. Um, study when the poll sequences are timed. Probably about 60 to 70% of the quiz this week is simply the parameters of frequency matrix, phase matrix, and slice thickness. And then what event is happening when this gradient turns on? Because we really need to know this sequence, because like pulse sequence, the sequence of pulses, what pulses, RF and gradient. To understand all fast spin echoes and MRAs and all the other things we're going to talk about, you got to understand these basics because everything else is a variation. Okay. Yes. And sometimes I go for three hours. I know you may have faded out there and didn't pay attention to part of it, but that's why we record it. I don't like to go for three hours, but yeah, you should. That's all I have. I'm going to open up the exit ticket. When you're done with the exit ticket, you are free to log off. I will definitely hang around and answer questions for as long as you would possibly like. Get questions about stuff you do in clinicals, questions about this week's lecture or anything else. Feel free to hang around. Ask those questions. Hey, Kevin, let me just jump in for a moment here. Oh, this yeah, is Jim, everybody. Um, Sexual anatomy begins at one o'clock Pacific time. Okay, I won't go as long as Kevin, so it all evens out. <laughs> all right, so I'll see you guys shortly. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Okay. Okay, exit tickets are now open. If you don't see them, just refresh your browser. When you're done, you are good to go. Yeah, I, I've got to use a lot of examples and animations and visuals, or I can't explain it either. Y'all can't learn it, I can't explain it. So once again, you can turn off your camera while you're doing the exit ticket too. You can leave it on if you want, but you, you don't have to show it. Just make sure to finish the exit ticket before you log off.
Yeah, I hope you do too. Sometimes, like, yeah, not starting clinicals is rough. It's just part of the, it. Just happens sometimes. I may have Angela. I haven't really looked at my emails this morning yet because I was trying to get everybody's grades in the judgy. I'm sure I received it though. Let me check real quick. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, I got you just. I should respond to that. I will respond to it. Yeah, and that's totally fine. You're fine, Angela. Just, yeah, make sure to upload your notes. Yeah. Yeah, have a great week. Yeah, have a good day. Yeah, what's your question, Joshua? I, I probably did. Like I said, I just haven't responded to ones I received yesterday afternoon or this morning yet. Um, yeah, so in my email I sent, um, I was a little late because of some technical issues with my computer, but that affected last night me doing the, the quiz as well. Ah, OK. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a whole week, so I shouldn't have waited as long, but is it possible to get like a code from you to attempt the late credit thing on the quiz? Yeah, yeah I'll open it back up. That's fine. Okay. I have no problem. What I have a problem with is when people miss quizzes and they don't tell me about it and it goes on for like a while and I'm like, <laughs> it's quiz. You miss a quiz, it's, I do not care that much. I care more that you just like let me know so I can open it back up for you and you can take the quiz because what I don't want to happen is like, a week from now you're trying to take the quiz and it's like well we're farther in the class now and then you haven't actually studied that stuff and like we've got that right. feedback so that is totally fine let me open it up for you right now before I... all right so yeah you got till midnight tonight does that work or you need more time no that's perfect that's fine all right it's open you can take it now all right thank you no problem yeah kevin i need mine open as well yeah i'm gonna do it right now eric Yep, it's open. But the else is open. Thank you, sir. Taking it right now. All right. Um, Jacob, the quiz is always multiple choice or true false. Quiz is always multiple choice and true false. Because guess what the ART is? Multiple choice and true false. So I train you the way that you're going to be expected to perform. Difficult, true, false, and multiple choice questions.
The only ones that are different are like my parameter questions because those are like a drop down, but it's still a multiple choice. It's still choose one of the choices you're given. It looks slightly different, but yeah, it's multiple choice or, or true false. Kevin, I have a question. Yeah, no, what you got? Uh, in regards to like the uh, gradients, um, like the physical gradients, so slice, slice select uh, would be Z, correct? For an axial. Yeah, and then um, I got a little bit confused when you said top to bottom in, in regards to like phase encoding. Um, would that be a Y gradient? It depends. You can choose what it's going to be. You can choose your phase and frequency direction whenever you set up a scan. So we can always say, like, if you tell me what orientation the image is in, I can tell you which gradient will be slice select. But I can't tell you which one is going to be frequency and phase until you set up your scan. Oh, I see what you're saying now. Yeah, that had me yeah. confused. Yeah. So could it be? Now, all, but what you can say is that, like, if I said uh, axial slices, okay, axial slices, Z gradient has to be the slice select. And then I told you the phase encoding gradient is the X. Which one is frequency? Well, it's like, okay, well, Z is slice select, X is phase, the one left is Y. So Y has to be frequency. Okay, I see what you're saying now. But I won't ask that question on the quiz. Or at least not this quiz. <laughs> All righty. Thank you very much. You guys have a good day. You too, Noel. I have a quick question about the signal to noise ratio. So yeah. you know how you were saying when... Um, when it's too much of it, it starts becoming grainy, the images. Mm -hmm. Is it because of the actual, from how loud it is that it starts to make the coil on the patient vibrate? Or is that, is it, that's not related to because of why the image came out grainy? No, no. So when we're talking about noise, we're talking about noise in the sense of like, background information that gets into your signal and messes up the signal. So um, it comes from like random uh, information inside the computer. It comes from random stuff inside the patient's body, but it's not noise as in loud noise. It's a noise as in uh, when we're talking about signals. So noise is just what makes it grainy, right? And we call it noise because of radios, because it used to be like when you have a radio or if you're driving in your car away from a radio tower and it starts to hear all that crackle, that's where they get, that's where the term noise came from. But yeah, it just looks like graininess on the screen. And it comes from not having enough signal. Um, so it's like when we talk about it, we talk about what's called the SNR or signal to noise ratio. So we want to have a lot of signal versus how much noise there is in our echo. If our signal goes down, then the noise shows up on our image. Or if the signal stays high, but we get more noise, then the noise shows up on our image. So we're adjusting SNR to get more signal, so that way we have a ratio of higher signal to noise, and then we don't get that graininess on our image. Okay. All right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. Kevin, I'm going to uh, jump off. Yeah, we're done. All right. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate you being here. Thanks. Man.